there is an object hidden in the sky. Our predecessors studied its appearances. Like a vast clockwork apparatus, it appeared on a fixed timeline and disappeared whole civilizations. They have left us records of this invisible eye in the sky and how they hid underground from its face. They feared the return of the phoenix. The man who would be known as Charles Ford was born in Albany, New York on August 6, 1874. He died in the Bronx on May 3, 1932, almost 58 years old. In ordinary longevity, Charles Ford was anything but normal. One of the last of a dying breed of rogue intellectuals, Ford was a thinker. What science has failed to do for itself, he has done for the layman. Ford's legacy is preserved today in 1,054 pages of his continually republished books. Between London's British Museum archives and the New York Public Library, he spent 27 years amassing the most unusual compilation of historical data ever released to the public. He stands as a pillar of erudition impervious to any weight of criticism, for his source materials are impeccable. The proceeding... Proceedings of the Academy of Natural Sciences, American Antiquarian, Archaeological Journal, British Astronomical Association, the Carnegie Institute, Chemical News, Comps Rendus, Edinburgh Review, Essex Naturalist, Geological Magazine, Intellectual Observer, Journal of Asiatic Society, Knowledge, La Arnat, these are just a few. Of his four books, there are three we are concerned with. Ford's astronomical and geological data span 833 pages of documented reports, witness accounts, and studies in the Book of the Damned, published in 1919, New Lands, published in 1923, and Lowe, 1931. The collected material spanning 334 years, from the year 1597 to the year 1931. Fort catalog thousands of findings, events, observations, and discoveries from around the world. Amazingly, in this 334-year stretch of history, there is only one small period noted by him as distinct from all the rest. 1901, 1902, and 1903. Very specifically, 1902. These years are noted in all three books and receive more of his attention than any other time period. To Fort, the prophet of the unexplained, these three years were not merely visited with unusual localized phenomena, but were, but were worldwide, as well as interplanetary in scale. Fort notes that in 1902 appeared a strange new star, a light-reflecting body. Newtonian astronomy unable to account for what was clearly observed in 1902, this star was quickly forgotten on the principle that what cannot be readily explained need be readily ignored. Unable to assail Fort's sources and unwilling to entertain his conclusions, the academic community bullied him with silence. A pillar to the laity, he was poisoned to the learned, an oracle of insight ignored into obscurity. In the beginning of the Book of the Damned, he wrote, In this book I assemble some of the data that I think are of the falsely and arbitrarily excluded, the data of the damned. I have gone into the outer darkness of scientific and philosophical transactions and proceedings, ultra-respectable, but covered with the dust of disregard. I have descended into journalism. I have come back with the quasi-souls of lost data. We take the position that our data have been damned, upon no consideration for individual merits." Unquote. What offended the scientific establishment more than anything were Fort's conclusions. He said, other worlds were near to this Earth's surface. He also said, vast celestial vagabonds have been excluded by astronomers because they have not been seen so very often. However, light or dark, they have been seen and reported so often that, that the only important reason for their exclusion is they just don't fit in. Ford also said of vast worlds that are orbitless, or that are navigable, or that are adrift in interplanetary tides and currents. 
Nowhere in all of Ford's writings is there a reference to Phoenix as a planetary body, but intriguingly, in his book New Lands, he wrote that objects seen to obscure stars are planets, all of them not conventionally recognized as planets because of eccentricity and remoteness from the ecliptic. To so confidently publish these assertions induces us to again examine some more of Charles Fort's amazing resources. The London Royal Society Proceedings, the Magazine of Natural History, Manual of Astronomy, Meteorology, National Geographic Magazine, North American Review, Popular Astronomy, Popular Science Monthly, Records of Geological Society, Reliquary, Science, Scientific American, U.S. Geological Survey, The Weekly Dispatch. Our appraisal of the value of Charles Fort's research dictates that we must review it chronologically and begin at 1901. On February 13, 1901, a deep greenish-yellow cloud canopy spread intense darkness over the whole of France. On the 16th over Michigan in the United States, the wind died and a brown dust-like vegetable matter fell from the sky, bringing extreme coldness. On the 18th, observers in two different areas of London saw what appeared to be a comet, and a red substance fell with the snow near Mildenhall, England. Pigeons were even seen to eat it. On February 22, 1901, a new star appeared in the heavens in the Perseus constellation, seen by Americans, Europeans, and as far as Kiev in Russia, all northern hemisphere. Astronomers asserted that a spectrographic analysis revealed that this new star to be 300 light years away, and the newspapers picked up the story. But to the embarrassment of the astronomers, the newly appeared celestial body shot out nebulous rings that moved at a rate of two and three seconds of arc a day. This far exceeded the speed of light, demonstrating that the object was much closer to the Earth than the astronomers had believed. In his book New Lands, Charles Fort wrote, when the new star in Perseus appeared in February 1901, it was just a point of light. Something went out from it, giving it six months of a diameter equal to half of the apparent diameter of the moon. The appearances looked structural. Ford believed the dusts of 1901 and 1902 that fell on Earth from space came upon this object, came from this object. He notes that three years earlier, Dr. Epson, on January 16, 1898, observed something that looked like a cloud in the constellation Perseus. Dr. Epson wrote, Whatever it was, it had the peculiar property of dimming and blotting out the stars. It moved into Perseus, and then it moved away. On March 10, 1901, only 16 days after the appearance of this object in the sky, a great amount of red dust fell from the sky on Sicily, Tunis, Italy, Germany, and Russia. A thick orange-red stain was reported from Ongar, Essex, England. In Austria, while the dust fell, the earth quaked. On March 11th, as dust rained on Tunis, earthquakes afflicted Algeria. On March 12th, ashes fell from the sky at Avellino, Italy. A new star in Perseus. Dust reigns on the earth. Academia is quiet. Charles Fort, ever the philosopher in his findings, wrote, We substitute acceptance for belief. The more firmly established, the more difficult to change. And this was the problem with the scientific establishment. To Fort, to believe firmly in anything is to impede development. He maintained the existence of unknown planets and that dusts were, quote, things cast out in what is called space by convulsions of other planets, unquote. His conclusion, drafted before the year 1919, we are again in awe of some of his source materials. The American Academy of Sciences, the Annals of Scientific Discovery, the Bulletin of Seismographic Society, Chambers Journal, Cosmos, Edinburgh Annual Registrar, the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, The Field, uh, Gloucester, I guess it's Gloucester Journal, Human Nature, the Journal of British Astronomical Association, La Annie Scientifique, Magazine of Science, Nature Magazine. As in 1901, we find that the events of 1902 were also preceded by a few weeks by the appearance of a new star, this time in Gemini, as seen from South Africa. This was on the 16th. In April and May 1902, across a zone of this Earth, also, outside the zone, there were disturbances. More than Earth-wide relations are indicated, according to Ford. Ford itemizes a long list of these events. Volcanic eruptions of Mount Pele Martinique uh, at, I can't pronounce this, La Safir on St. Vincent 
and an earthquake in Siberia as mud fell from the sky in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and in Connecticut in North America. On May 7th, the sky over France turned black. Soot and water like ink fell upon Park St. Maur. On May 10th, a great number of highly colored objects like little suns were seen in the sky over South Devon. Later, later in May, in 1902, spectacular meteoric showers occurred over the West Indies. Earthquake shocks occurred in Spain and France, a volcanic eruption in Mexico, quakes in the Fiji Islands, a violent quake in Iceland, and a volcanic eruption at Cook's Island, Alaska. In Rangoon, Burma, it so happened that the most terrible storm that ever occurred was remembered. A remarkable meteor seen in Calcutta and in Java, the, the I guess it's Raung volcano, erupted as rumbling came from an extinct volcano in the country of France. Over Guatemala, a thunderstorm with terrific electrical discharges dumped enormous volumes of water during an earthquake. We are not finished with 1902 by half. Thus far, in this thesis, our Phoenix thesis has involved the month of May, the transits and local phenomena involving, involving our world of an object in the skies that the ancients referred to as Phoenix, that dumped mud, red rains, red sand, bloody, bloody water, whatever, however the ancients described it, over and over and over. And Charles Fort's 1902 data now indicates phenomena on a solar system-wide scope. And again, a new star appears, but this time not in Perseus or Gemini, but in the southern constellation Puppis, as reported in popular astronomy. It appeared in October, and Fort again theorizes this new star is responsible for the following phenomena. In October 1902, vast amounts of smoke-like haze of unknown origin obscured all things at sea from the Philippines to Hong Kong and the Philippines to Australia. It was so thick it impeded navigation. This blanketing of the Southern Pacific was only a couple weeks before a series of atmospheric fallouts that would not end until well into 1903. By November 12, 1902, our world had traveled along the ecliptic to the opposite side of the sun as it was positioned six months earlier in the month of May. On November 12th and 13th, 1902, occurred the greatest fall of matter in the history of Australia. Upon the 14th of November, it rained mud in Ta Ta Tasmania. There was a haze from Australia to Hong Kong, hundreds of millions of tons of matter that fell upon Australia, Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, and Europe in 1902 and 1903. Blankets of dust and sometimes mud caked ships to where all hands had to be reported on deck just to scoop and shovel mud off, off the ships in order for it not to capsize. As dust, dirt, and mud rained on Australia, the densest darkness lit up with glares. Fires were falling from the sky as seen through giant pockets of mud. Balls of fire from the sky fell upon and ignited the ground in every district of Victoria, even setting fire to houses. At Wyshen Proof, the whole air seemed on fire. Buildings were burnt in Bort, Allendale, Delinquin, uh, Langdale, and Chiltern. This incendiary sky was followed by a rain of red dust and darkness through about 50 towns in Australia. They suffered this darkness and disasters and Fort wrote, little of this tremendous occurrence has been told in the publications that are said to be scientific. It has been ignored. Australian reports read that there was nothing like it before in the history of the colony with people stumbling about blind with lanterns. On the same day, November 12, 1902, ashes with sulfurous odor fell in New Zealand. A meteorite fell at Kamsagar, Mysore, India, and disastrous flooding happened in the Malay states. Seven bridges carried away. Also, volcanoes erupted at, I guess it's Kilauea, uh, Hawaii, and on the 13th, a volcano at Savi and Samoa erupted, and at Windward Islands, West Indies, Stromboli, and Mount uh, Chulapata in Peru. That's my best guess. Over Parramatta, Australia, and on the 13th, a meteor exploded. Five days later, on the 18th, a fireball fell, exploding terrifically at Karkor. At Murrumburra, Australia, dust and a large fireball fell from the sky. Ford notes that on this day, the new star and puppet shined at its greatest magnitude when a six-foot tidal surge struck the coast of southern Australia. 
On the 20th, Sir Charles Todd of LA Observatory reported a large fireball was seen moving so slowly it was observed for a total of four minutes. On the 21st, a fireball uh, apparent size of the sun was seen at Taweta. An hour later, several towns illuminated by a great fireball or an explosion. The next day, on the 22nd, a fireball passed over the town of Nangan, Australia, intensely illuminating the night and ground, and a fireball exploded at Ipswich, Queensland. Though Fort covered 334 years of documented reports, he specifically focuses on 1902 and 1903 as particularly unique. Concerning the contorted scientific reasonings of his day, he wrote in the book Low that it belongs to the Dark Age or the other Dark Age of the year 1902. Despite the knowledge of the ancient Ionian Greeks who knew that fallen stars were stones from the sky, Ford notes that as late as November 1902, in Nature Notes, pages 13 through 23, an actual member of the Selborne Society still argued that meteorites do not fall from the sky and that there are masses of iron upon the ground in the first place that attract lightning. This ridiculous blindness brought out Ford's cynical humor. He said, I do not know what the mind of an astronomer looks like, but I think of a fizzle with excuses revolving around it. Fort observed that scientists have perpetuated the most ridiculous notions rather than to admit the arrival of dust from somewhere beyond this world. Or, as put by, Fo by Charles Fort, sands from other worlds or from their deserts, red rains that very strongly suggest blood or finely divide divided animal matter debris from interplanetary disasters. Also, in his book, The Book of the Damned, he wrote, I begin with the notion of some other world from which objects and substances have fallen to this earth. Every living thing upon this earth may ancestrally have come from somewhere else. This is amazing for conclusions that were made just from reading scientific reports over a century ago. Ford believed that the things he found documented as having fallen from the sky were from the surface materials wrenched away from another world. In 1919, this was a fantastic notion. We can only marvel at Ford's own source materials once again. The American Journal of Science, the Catalog of Destructive Earthquakes, Entomological News, Journey of the Franklin Institute, Journal, excuse me, Les Mondes, Monthly Weather Review, Notes and Queries, Observatory, the Quarterly Journal of the Geologic Society, Science Monthly, Smithsonian Institute Annual Report, the Victorian Naturalist, Yearbook of Facts, Zoologist Magazine. Ford's findings and conclusions were an assault on the cherished conventions of the scientific community, but he did not lay much to their charge, noting, no scientist has ever upheld a new idea without bringing upon himself abuse from other scientists. Science has done its utmost to prevent whatever science has done. By way of explanation, in the Book of the Damned, he wrote, The world of astronomers is in a state of terrorism, though of a highly attenuated, modernized, and devitalized kind. Let an astronomer see something that is not of the conventional celestial sights, or something that is improper to see, his very dignity is in danger. We are left with the impression of vast debris fields strung around the sun along our orbital path on the ecliptic. This notion is strengthened in Ford's analysis of the year 1903. On February 14th, Valentine's Day 1903, the blackest of darkness over Australia occurred, followed by a deluge of dust and mud upon 40 towns in New South Wales and Victoria. The material that fell in Australia fell about as enormously as that that fell in the dusts of Europe. It was a tremendous blanketing of dust, dirt, and mud straight from the skies over Europe. For several days, the south of England was a dumping ground from somewhere else. Red dust fell as far away as the Canary Islands and on the, uh, on the 19th. On the 27th, this fall of dust continued in Belgium, Holland, Germany, and Austria. A vessel reported that dust fell into the Atlantic midway between Southampton and Barbados. In England, it was estimated at 10 million tons of fallen matter, and again, 50 tons per square mile in Australia alone. 
Also, at Switzerland, Russia, and from February to March 1903, dust and discolored rains fell on the western coasts of Africa. Fort wrote that the matter is variously described as brick dust, red dust colored, as reddish raindrops and gray sand, quite red, yellow, and brown. Chemists of the time proclaimed that tests of the red dust revealed 9.08% organic matter or as much as 36% organic matter, depending on the sample that was taken. As 1902 was called a dark age, 1903 is the other year specifically commented on by Fort. He said, I think myself that in 1903 we passed through the remains of a powdered world left over from an ancient interplanetary dispute brooding in space like red resentment ever since. Unquote. Fort published his opinion that the near approach by another world to this world would be catastrophic. Also, he said, I accept that some of the other worlds are of conditions very similar to our own. I think of others that are also very different. Though the reports came from all over the, all over the world, Fort notes that the astronomers in 1902 and 1903 remained quiet, loathing to ponder an origin for dust outside of our world, while meteorologists pontificated that storms kicked up African sand from the Sahara. Fort searched the weather reports of the time. There were no storms in the Sahara, in Africa. He also shows that the sand of the Sahara is white, not red. Nor were any volcanic eruptions occurring in 1903. However, Charles Ford does note something unusual. The appearance of a new star. In Ford's book, Lo, we read, It was found by a professional astronomer upon photographs of the constellation Gemini taken upon March 8th this new star appeared. It may have existed a few weeks before somebody happened to photograph this part of the sky. A luminary is not necessarily a star, but could just just as the same be a light reflecting body, a planet, even moving toward or away from the inner solar system. Over two months later, on May 20th, 1903, Professor Lowell of the Lowell Observatory observed a dust cloud on the terminator of Mars that moved 300 miles in a few days. Less than three months later, on August 9th, 1903, a red luminous object was observed by four persons using field glasses for over a 20-minute period. Like Phoenix, this object was moving from north to south. That is another common denominator of all the Phoenix, lit, all the Phoenix phenomena. It was always an object that darkened the sun that had suddenly appeared out of the northern heavens, passed over the ecliptic, traveling southward to vanish again once it was off the ecliptic. ecliptic. It did not travel along the plane of the ecliptic like all the other planets do, like we do. Any correlation between the appearance of new stars in 1901, 1902, and 1903 and the dust blanketing Earth is still a mystery. Fort believed they were connected, and so worldwide was this, was this deluge of cosmic dust. He wrote that it was the greatest atmospheric cataclysm in the history of the world. Despite the academic animosity, scientific disregard for Charles Ford's work and theories. His sources were of the highest reputability. Astrophysical Journal, Chemical News, Elements of Astronomy, English Mechanic, Leeds Astronomical Society, Journal of Royal Meteorological Society, La, Na La Nature, La Astronomie. We have Memoirs of the National Academy of Sciences, Nautical Meteorological Annual, Report of the British Association, Sidereal Messenger, Tim's yearbook, U.S. Weather Bureau report. These are just some of Charles Fort's documented events for 1901, 1902, and 1903. There were more in his writings. As we exist within a controlled holographic environment, the simulacrum, each 138-year period manifests events that mirror or are linked and connected to other historic events that occurred in those 138-year episodes. This means that the widely documented occurrences in 1902 are holographically connected to all the prior Phoenix destructions, and this fact is further demonstrated in the unfolding of events in 1902 that Charles Ford did not document. Here are events in 1901, 1902, and 1903 intrinsically connected to the Phoenix history. The Cincinnati Astral Society published a prediction that a new comet would soon be discovered 
and that it orbited an unknown planet. This happened in 1902 with Comet Morehouse, photographed as it broke apart and the scientific community theorized at the time that it did orbit an unknown body, not the Sun. Interesting, interestingly, also in 1901, the Astral Society predicted that a gigantic passenger stream steamliner would sink between Britain and the United States with a loss of life primarily due to inadequate lifeboats, which did occur 10 years later or thereabout with the Titanic. In May, Mount Pele explosion that killed over 30,000 people in a blast of superheated gas is widely known. It was also mentioned uh, in passing by Charles, Charles Ford, but what happened afterward is not widely known. Quickly after the volcanic explosion, it was noticed by the scientific community that plants and animals returned to Martinique, but were much bigger than usual, exceptionally sized plants, animals, and insects. Even the on-site researchers, Dr. Jules Gravior, grew 2.5 inches taller, and his assistant, Dr. Round, aged 59, grew almost 2 inches. Interestingly, Martinique had previously been visited by Christopher Columbus. In 1902, a volcanic eruption covered the ancient Olmec site of Abai Takalik. The Olmeca, as shown in our prior videos, were wiped out in a phoenix cataclysm, and their final date still marked the year 31 BC in our calendar, which is a phoenix visitation year. In 1902, Sir Norman Lockyer research on Stonehenge was complete and published in his book Stonehenge and Other British Stone Monuments. The site destroyed in 2239 BC and again in 1687 BC, Phoenix catastrophes, both times re-erected re by locals and mentioned many times in our prior videos. Minoan Crete, the city of Knossos in the Mediterranean, excavated from 1901 to 1903, a civilization that was destroyed several times, including the catastrophic resets of 2239 and 1687 BC by the Phoenix phenomenon. Again, our video, our prior videos cover these topics. Just seconds after being sighted by the crew of the ship Algonquin, the SS Bannock burn vanished in Lake Superior in 1902. From a distance, the crew of the SS Heronica reported strange lights in the sky. The ship could not have sunk in seconds, and searching the lake, a massive effort to search the lake was conducted over years, and even today, Lake Superior has never revealed the location of this ship. All 23 men on board were never seen again. In the Gulf of Guinea, the stunned crew of the SS Fort Salisbury in South Atlantic witnessed a gigantic construction descend from the sky and lower into the ocean in front of their ship. It was dark, about 600 feet long, and it disturbed the water as it submerged. It also had a light at each end. This object is perfectly described as those seen in the skies over Europe in the year 1347 that were blamed for the Black Death Plague. Please see our video. We have shown that the figure of Enoch is connected to both the Great Pyramid of Giza in traditions as, it, as he is to the Phoenix. Interestingly, in 1902 was published the most authoritative translation of the Book of Enoch ever done. It was, it was done from 15 ancient manuscripts by Dr. Fleming uh, in Le Leipzig. In 1901 was born Hans Bellamy who would study the records of history and publish fascinating books all relative to the Phoenix phenomenon without ever linking these cataclysmic episodes to the Phoenix mythos. He wrote the book Moons, Myth, and Man in 1936. The book of Revelation is History in 1941, built before the flood was published in 1944, in the beginning God in 1945, the Atlantis myth in 1948, and Plato and Horbiger in 1945. Over and over, Bellamy references Phoenix disasters without knowing they are all connected, even mentioning that the Maya were familiar with a 2,760-year cycle, which is a Phoenix sum. It is precisely 138 times 20. But his conclusions were not accepted by the, by the establishment historians of the time. For three years since 1899, mineralogist and archaeologist William Niven excavated deeper in, the ru deeper in some ruins in the northwest corner of the Valley of Mexico and came unexpectedly across vast layers of what appeared to be very ancient ruins, whole prehistoric cities lying as deep as 30 feet below the plain, which appeared to be overwhelmed by a series of cataclysmic tidal waves. That was his conclusion. 
Niven found an arched wooden door that had petrified the stone. The walls of this house were bound by a cement that was harder than the stone itself. One uncrushed room 30 feet long was found to be completely filled with dirt. Niven discovered three new minerals, citriolite, thorgon, and ninevite. And in 1921, he excavated a depth of 12 feet in Santiago, oh, I can't pronounce this, Ahuizado, in Mexico, a series of stone tablets with very unusual pictographs. 975 of these were found at first, but he continued excavations and eventually unearthed 2,600 of these tablets. They were cataloged, and the top Mayan scholar of the day, Sylvanus G. Morley, concluded that they were unlike anything he had ever seen. Niven in 1902 discovered this unknown American civilization. 1902 being a phoenix year, these cities have most assuredly met their end by an undocumented phoenix cataclysm. So perfect was that destruction that we have no records of what this civilization, uh, uh, what time period, who these people were, who their descendants were. We, we, have, we, we know nothing. History has absolutely been erased by the phoenix cataclysm. The scientific community had a book written about the discoveries, but coded anagrams in the narrative so the public could easily decode the anagram as reading not really in the title and other hints that Niven's discoveries were untrue. This type of censorship has gone on for over a hundred years. The scientific establishment has been caught over and over and over publishing false narratives in their efforts to cover up true discoveries. In 1902, excavations in the ancient Assyrian capital of Nineveh began. Tablets in Akkadian were discovered everywhere. The Code of Hammurabi was excavated, the text conveying laws of ancient Babylon as passed down from the Anunnaki. Also, the Babylonian tablets, the Enema Elish, translated into English from the Akkadian, read that in the beginning, the whole world was covered in blood of the slain dragon Tiamat. By this we understand that at a cataclysmic event in a pre-literary period, reddish rains fell from the sky just as they did in 1902. Budge and King published the Annals of the Kings of Assyria, wherein is read in the records of King Ashurnasirpal II from Akkadian texts about the location of Mount Nasir where Utnapishtim, this is the Sumerian Noah, or the Akkadian Noah, where his ship came to rest after the flood in the Epic of Gilgamesh. This was 1902. So it's very curious that also in 1902, George Hagopian, an Armenian, trekked up Mount Ararat in Turkey during a time when the ice cap was diminished. He explored a giant wooden ship. Its timbers were petrified at 12,000 foot elevation. Many claim this to be Noah's Ark. Soon afterward, though, a Russian scientific expedition visited the site with the military. They visited the relic, they located it, they visited it, they measured it, they went inside, they, they measured all the chambers, they photographed everything, they returned to the government right in time for the Bolshevik Revolution. And the Bolsheviks seized the records and they have never been seen since. Also in 1902, Valerio Stace happened upon an ancient device in the donated materials from the Museum of Athens. This was the famous Antikythera device found in 1901 by sponge divers from the wreckage of a sunken ship from about 60 BC. Valerio realized the differential gears were a part of a device mechanism, but he was ridiculed, silenced, and ignored by, this, by the establishment. Later, Dr. Derek de Sola Price determined that the device particularly indicated the year 586 BC and was used to calculate astronomical dates both forward and backward in time. Zechariah Sitchin determined the date was actually 584 BC. It is my opinion that the Phoenix year 583 BC is the true year and that Thales of Miletus in 585 BC used just such a device when he famously predicted the darkening of the sun two years before it happened in 583 BC. In 1902, Gaston Maspero founded the Egyptian Museum and began removing artifacts from the Giza Plateau. He succeeded Auguste Mariette of the Egyptian Antiquity Service. Maspero in 1902 also organized a massive multinational coalition of archaeologists that began working at different sites at Giza, the Sphinx, and Egypt's ruins. He compartmentalized these groups and almost censored, almost disallowed any communication between them. All information had to be filtered through his office. 
In the year 1879, Major John Wesley became the director of the Smithsonian Institute and the U.S. Bureau of Ethnology, its very first director. During his 27 years at the Smithsonian, he oversaw the systematic destruction of anomalous artifacts and archaeological reports concerning gigantic human skeletons, technological relics excavated, and discoveries of old world visitations found throughout North America. Old ships were purchased by Wesley's office and packed with artifacts and burned in the Atlantic. The director, Wesley, died in the year 1902. In 1903, Jesuit priest Emmanuel Magri began excavating the many thousands of human skeletons from the Hypogeum some with bizarre elongated skulls. He found pottery, other small objects, and diluvian sediment deposits. After the excavation, Father Magri was sent by the Vatican to Tunisia, where he mysteriously died. His drawings, excavation notes, and observations of the Hypogeum on Malta, the ruins, were all vanished. The ruins of Malta are the subject of our other videos on the Phoenix destructions that occurred in 2239 B.C. Despite the systemic cover-ups and establishment censorship of findings, there was something the scientific establishment was now paying attention to. In 1902, we find the first year that the United States initiated a new program of amassing data archives on natural disasters. While the word reset has entered the popular culture today, it primarily invokes the image of a catastrophe, a mud flood, a post-apocalyptic event. But we must recognize that this simulated holography we exist inside will first lay down the infrastructures that it will later reset. The past is always a predicate for the future, and for this reason, the simulacrum and its programmed agents continually suppress discoveries and even ideas. Now, the suddenly appearing aspects of our present everyday infrastructure are starting at the same time indicates in the holofield that they will terminate as abruptly as they appeared. This means that in 2040, the Phoenix appearance will not be quiet as it was in 1902. It will be an epic catastrophe that will suddenly end power grids, fluorescent lighting, assembly lines, manufacturing, automobile use, department stores, fast food, restaurants, instant foods, beverages, recreational activities, sporting events, oil or natural gas production, theaters, schools, toys, technology, medicine, treatment, surgery, radio communications, aircraft, libraries, public trans transportation, women's rights, U.S. and Britain will be crippled, the return to coal use, collapse of law and order, genocides, migrations to newly appearing regions formerly under sea. The U.S. Reclamation Act of 1902 is connected to 2040 in that the United States is going to have to, to, to continue its survival. It will have to reclaim former lands that were under sea. As we show in our prior videos on the cataclysm of 2040, Nostradamus, Ursula South Hill, and, ser and several other prophetic texts all infer that the oceans will slip their basins. New lands will be discovered because they were formerly ocean beds. The topography of our world will be fundamentally changed. It will be a pole shift. But remember, we're not actually on a planet hurling around the sun. We are inside a simulacrum of a universe that perpetuates the idea through visual optics that we are, we are on a planet going around a sun in a solar system. But we're actually confined in a Dyson shell-like prison. It is a prison of sense perceptions. It is an illusion. It is called the simulacrum. The year 1902 is one specifically pointed out by the French prophet of Jewish ancestry known to us as Nostradamus. David Ovason in his The Secret of Nostradamus provides evidence that the prophet believed that the year 1901 began the last days of the sun. Of course, it is my belief that Nostradamus meant 1902, and there is evidence of this. In 1994, members of the Italian National Library in Rome discovered buried in their archives a formerly unpublished and unknown, fully illustrated manuscript written by Nostradamus himself. The Roman author and Nostradamus expert, Ottavio Cesar Ramadi, in his own book, Nostradamus, the Lost Manuscript, wrote that concerning the year 1903, the prophet Nostradamus left us this message. He said, many will die before the phoenix dies. The Great Pyramid of Giza, the blocks of this, of this monument in Egypt are made of geopolymers, made through a process in which artificial stone is created that is virtually indistinguishable 
from natural rock. The limestone casing blocks of the geyser structure contain opal, CT hydroxyapatite, a silico aluminate not found in the quarries. Blocks containing numerous trapped air bubbles. Organic fibers have accidentally fallen into the mixture and they have been found inside the stone blocks of the, of the Great Pyramid. But you're not going to read this in the official establishment literature of the time. You're not going to find Zawi Hawa submitting this to anyone. The greatest evidence of the geopolymer construction of the Great Pyramid is the magnetite. When, when liquid rock cools, all the magnetite has time to point toward magnetic north, but not the geopolymers of the Great Pyramid and, and other ancient structures from the Old Bronze Age. They used a process of liquefying limestone, adding in composites that would harden it, and then they would cool it artificially fast, too fast for the magnetite crystals to align toward magnetic north. This is what we find. The magnetite is all in disarray. Sir Flinders Petrie, a hundred years ago, found abundant evidence of a drilling and boring technology employed in the structure that was beyond his ability to understand, but he documented it nonetheless. But a century later, Christopher Dunn recognized that these builders use ultrasonic drilling with diamond tip bits. Petrie's measurements are published in his book, The Pyramids and Temples of Giza. His measurements are accepted by Egyptologists and especially by Zawi Hawass, the head of Egypt's Antiquities Department. Hawass calls Petrie the father of Egyptology. In 1646, the monumental research of John Grease was published titled Pyramidography or a description of the pyramids of Egypt in England. He was then made the professor of astronomy at Oxford. This was the scientific world's first true examination of the Egyptian relics and great pyramids. Over two centuries later, in 1859, John Taylor completed his own work, The Great Pyramid. Why was it built and who built it? The book was published and became a sensation in the year 1860. The first book to theorize that the Great Pyramid was, a, was of biblical import, that it was a prophetic calendar erected by the biblical patriarchs. Unfortunately, his work was scoffed at by the Royal Society. Because the structure was located near ancient Egypt, they assumed it must be Egyptian. Taylor was the editor of the London Observer. Inspired by John Taylor's work on the Great Pyramid Mysteries, Astronomer Royal for Scotland, Charles P. Isaac Smith, traveled with his wife at his own expense to Egypt where he took careful measurements of the Great Pyramid in late 1864 and 1865 during the American Civil War. During his study of the structure, Smith became convinced of the Great Pyramid's biblical import. His findings were published in 1880 in his huge book, Our Inheritance in the Great Pyramid. At this time, Robert Menzies developed the theory that the pyramid inch and its length represented a single year in world history. Every measurement of the monument made in these made was in pyramid inches, which is very interesting because the unit that he found is exactly one one fractal of the 365.25 days it takes the Earth to go around the sun. It's a, a the research of Robert Menzies was absolutely fascinating for the time. Smith quickly adopted the view of Menzies, even producing evidence to support it. However, Taylor, Smith, Menzies, and, the, and those thereafter, like David Davidson, all employed inaccurate chronologies of the world, or inaccurate measurements of the Giza structure, which caused the pyramid inch theory to fall into academic disfavor. They made obvious mistakes and even employed, and even did, I've even made the same mistake of applying current events and misdating prophetic material and they did it to the extent while using the physical measurements of the Great Pyramid that it was really easy to disprove them. David Davidson was an English engineer who sought to prove Robert Menzies wrong that the Great Pyramid was not a prophetic calendar of historical timeline and stone. He extensively studied and measured the monument and completely changed his mind. His own mammoth book, The Great Pyramid, Its Divine Message, with Egerton Sykes, ended up supporting Menzies, Smith, and Taylor, but added a wealth of new supporting evidence. By 1926, his book was famous. Adam Rutherford came next, releasing his four-volume work, Pyramidology, in 1957, that also added much more evidence of the pyramid calendar theory. All these men were correct in their theory, but corrupt in their calculations. Graham Hancock and Robert Bovell, two authors that I have a lot of problems with, but putting that aside, they had a stroke of genius, and this is what they wrote. 
In the message of the Sphinx in Appendix 3, they come very close to understanding the purpose of the Great Pyramid's holospheric function, function. Not its engineering purpose, don't get them confused. They wrote that the function of the Giza blueprint is to provide a virtually indestructible holographic apparatus. Living man is the result of the holographic union between matter and spirit. It would very much appear that the followers of Horus, Shimshu Hor, understood the cosmic mechanism to somehow re-separate the two. The construction of the amazing holographic starstone apparatus of Giza. The Giza interior is definitely a blueprint. Now, this is me now. The Giza interior is definitely a blueprint um, that it is linked to an, an interface with the holosphere we are immersed inside is very true. That it serves as a cosmic mechanism is also correct, but Hancock and Bovel do not even know anything about the Phoenix chronology. None of their multitudes of published books even hint that they are aware that our world is on a fixed 138 year timeline going back to before the flood. And that many biblical events fall perfectly in sync with this 138 year timeline. The following data is unknown to them, which only makes me appreciate their observations even more. The earliest traditions of the Great Pyramid of Giza are not Egyptian and assert that it was designed to endure through a cataclysm. That it, that it provided a basis of knowledge for future generation was its purpose. Internal measurements scientifically conducted by Sir Flinders Petrie of the rectilinear subterranean passage widths, chamber heights, passage length and descendant and ascendant passages easily provide a uniform unit of measurement that was used by the constructors throughout the monument. These measurements were discovered over a century ago and were conducted to disprove the wildly popular pyramid inch theories of the time. These measurements are scientifically acceptable today, absolutely precise, and they are arranged in rectilinear lengths of 138, 552, 1518, 1656, 2070, 3036, 4140, and 5796. Every single number divisible by 138. The orbital period of the Phoenix object. Petrie knew nothing of the Phoenix. Four meticulously illustrated charts of the interior of the Great Pyramid exhibit precisely multitudes of measurements all divisible by 138. We must conclude that the builders of the Great Pyramid of Giza were aware of the Phoenix object and this awareness allowed them to know when it would return over and over again. We also conclude that the world of the Sethites of Enoch and later Abraham was not the primitive society that we have been led to believe. The Great Flood of 2239 B.C. did not catch them unaware. They prepared for it. These measurements prove the Phoenix object will return to visit great destruction on our modern world in May 2040. The sixth seal of the apocalypse of the biblical narrative in the book of Revelation, which was borrowed from the older Greek Sibylline oracles, is the subject matter. It is the end game for whatever this Phoenix repetitive destruction is. Edgar Cayce, known popularly as the Sleeping Prophet, is accused by many of being a medium of witchcraft, God-touched, demon-possessed, a formerly illiterate simpleton whose mind is in touch with transdimensional beings that divulge to him secrets. Whatever the case may be, he has been right many times in the diagnosis of ailments of his neighbors and scientifically documented case studies where Edgar Casey nailed exactly what somebody was suffering he, and, and he did it through dreaming. Now, what Edgar Casey says about the Great Pyramid, which is a subject matter he should know absolutely nothing about, is amazing. He said, the Great Pyramid is a record in stone of the history and development of man to the end of the present Earth cycle. It rec its records are written in the language of mathematics, geometry, and astronomy, as well as in the kinds of stone that are used after the end of this cycle. There is to be yet another change in the Earth's position. That is amazing. He further says that it... That it signifies the return of the great initiate for the culmination of the prophecies. All changes that have come and are to come are shown there in the passages of the Great Pyramid from the base to the top. Changes are signified by the layer of stone. Again, this is fascinating. In my own book, When the Sun Darkens and in Chronicon, I show that the, the terminal date 
for the basement of the Great Pyramid ends in 1902. And this is by many different, different mathematical computations. What's fascinating is that 1902 to the year 2106, which is the 6,000th year from the beginning of the pole shift of 3895 BC, which was started by Phoenix, is exactly 6,000 years. But from 1902 to 2106 is 204 years, which, if Edgar Casey is correct, 203 levels of the Great Pyramid plus the chief cornerstone is 204. Put another way, 1902 was the beginning of the Giza course countdown to the arrival and finishing of the monument. The Giza course countdown is 203 years. 1902 is 203 years to 2105, which was the end year to Nostradamus. He didn't take in consideration there was one more neat year needed to finish the monument. The pyramid today has no capstone. The chief cornerstone was a very ancient belief that God was coming to earth only once the monument of man was completed. We are a long way off from understanding the function of the Great Pyramid, engineering beyond our present comprehension. Continued discoveries made public bear this out. In 1993, Rudolf Gattenbrink sent up a specially invented robot up one of the mysterious shafts ex extending up through the courses of masonry from the Queen's Chamber where the robot discovered a photograph and photographed a mysterious and virtually inaccessible tiny door with a copper handle. This sensational find dispels the view that the shafts were intended for viewing the stars or were air shafts. The door is closed and the shafts will require tiny mirrors which they do not which they do not have, uh, and would ha they would have to open straight out or extend to the exterior faces of the monument. The Gant Ganton Brink discovery contributes to the fact that the Great Pyramid, the only structure with these unique shafts, had a specific technolithic function, an engineering purpose. There is no telling how many discoveries like this have not been made public. These are amazing, amazing revelations that the, archi that the architecture is absolutely so precise. These are not the measurements of Menzies and Taylors and Taylor and Smith and, and Davidson or even Rutherford. These are the measurements that are accepted by the scientific authorities. These are the only measurements that I can go on in the propagation of my theory that history is divided into 138 year segments leading to a reset in 2040. Now, every boxed measurement is divisible by 138. All these measurements, these are verticals. These are, these, are, these, are, these are sloping distances. Sloping distances are not the same as straight distances. They have to be scientifically measured. But every single boxed number you see on this chart is divisible not only by 138, but was measured by Sir Flinders Petrie and is exact to the thousandth of an inch. Again, it's absolutely amazing. Golden proportion is 144, yet the 144th level of blocks was exactly 4140 pyramid inches, which is again divisible by 138. The technolithic device is an ancient gigantic machine, a projector that required a massive power source that activated it from 3 to 7 seconds, needed to upload this 138 year cataclysm protocol into our holospheric coating. This was done by an enemy of humanity. The chief cornerstone who will descend is the defeater of this enemy. 41-story stone structure of laser precision tolerances scientifically measured to contain a coating based of rectilinear distances of units all divisible by 138, a holospheric template of the future built over 48 centuries ago. The Great Pyramid of Giza is a crystalline geopolymer resonance generator carrying out a 138-year cataclysm protocol. Brahma and Saraswati, known in Genesis as Abram and Sarai, were, well, uh, well, Abram was born in 1947-48 Annus Mundi, which was the old Hebrew reckoning year, it was the year of the rabbis. Now, this translates in our Anno Domini calendar as 1947-48 BC. Very unusual. Again, this is simulation theory evidence that a calendar that was started in retrospect would line up so perfectly, especially considering the fact that this was the exact epicenter between the beginning of the Anno Domini calendar and the beginning of the Annus Mundi original Hebrew calendar before rabbinical, rabbinical corruption. What this means is, is that Abraham and Abraham was actually born at the intersect of two timekeeping systems, one going backward and one going forward. Very unusual. Therefore, Abraham and his message are 
palindromic. It's like a giant world history isometric projection, which leads us to year one being 3895 BC. And the end of that simulation being 1 AD, the beginning of the Anno Domini calendar. Now, 3895 BC has been shown by multiple, multiple, uh, different, uh, clinical patterns, ancient calendars, the, the conclusions of Emmanuel Velikovsky and some of his dating. If his dating is correct, then year one would definitely be 3895 BC. Stephen Jones, in his Secrets of Time, independently dated that using the Assyrian eponyms and his own, uh, decoding of all the chrono markers in the book of uh, Jasher. There's just so many different ways to determine it. All these charts that you're seeing right now show that all these ancient calendrical systems basically use 3895 BC as year one. Now, the disservice that has been given to us from the rabbis of old and carried, carried on into the future, uh, by, by, uh, Christians misunderstanding the text that they were, they were studying is that year one was not the creation event. The world is not 6,000 years old. 3895 BC was year one of the ancient world because the Phoenix weapon had been activated and a 930 year old civilization came to an end. It was a 30 degree displacement of the lithosphere that destroyed everything. Oceans slipped over their basins. Continents were submerged. Everything was destroyed in such totality that it began every single ancient cal calendrical system. It was a new heavens and new earth because now different star patterns were seen in different locations of the sky because of the 30, the 30 degree displacement of the entire surface of the world. We have shown in our many videos that the Phoenix is named. It was a testimony against the Archons, those that believe they rule the world, that it is the mechanism of apocalypse and it is responsible for so many of the recess and cataclysms throughout world history. The subject matter of all these videos serves to show that these timelines go all the way up to the year 1902 and for a very profound reason. Not just what occurred in 1902, but calendrically in the holosphere what 1902 represents. We are also reminded that in the ancient world the person of Enoch slash Enki was deeply associated with the architecture of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. The entire ascended passage, gallery, and king's chamber distance is precisely 3895 inches, where it ends at the descending passage conjunct, the BC timeline collapsing into the Common Era, or the Anno Domini timeline, at the exact chronometrical location that forms the year 5796, or in our calendar, 1902. We find here an internal chronometrical timeline indicating the year 5796, when the architecture now shifts its focus from the internal to the external. 1902 AD thus becomes year one of an entirely new calendar, and the exterior of the monument now provides the chronometry revealing the end of the Great Pyramid calendar. And the architecture of the Great Pyramid has always been self-referencing over and over again. It provides many, many ways to measure the exact same thing. This is an absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal monument, a piece of architecture that it's, we're incapable of, uh, we're incapable of replicating what was done, this holographic timepiece in stone. And all the measurements are absolutely scientific by Sir Flinders, Sir Flinders Petrie, Petrie accepted today. A true mine of enigmas. In the book of the secrets of Enoch, we read this passage. He wrote all these signs of the creation which the Lord created and wrote 366 books and handed them over to his sons and remained on earth 30 days and was again taken up into heaven on the sixth day of the month, Siphon, on the very day and hour when he was born. In verse 6 we read that Methuselah and his brethren, all the sons of Enoch, made haste and erected an altar at the place called Akuzan, where Enoch had been taken up into heaven. In my very first published book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza, is definitively shown that the place called Akuzan was later known as Giza, that it, it was regarded as an altar of God in the land of Egypt. 
And now look at this chart. Again, we find right here a biblical verse in the book of Isaiah that says the exact same thing. In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border, border means Giza, Giza means border, thereof to the Lord, and it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. This is the altar of Adam. It, this is also the pillar of Enoch. They are one in the same. And the geometrical value for this passage is 5448, which just happens to be exactly the height of the Great Pyramid today, minus the chief cornerstone, 5,448 inches. The reason this is relevant is because the intended geometrical height of the Great Pyramid, if it had its capstone, would be 5,814 inches, which is 366 inches higher than it is today. Why is this relevant? Because Enoch was said to have written 366 books. But this is a code. We're talking about the chief cornerstone arriving to sit upon the monument of man. A book is merely a container of knowledge. There are 366 units here that identify this chief cornerstone. But the book is not an actual book. It's what the chief cornerstone represents. In the beginning, there were two trees. Two great pyramids mirrored these trees. One was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One was the tree of life. The tree of life seems to have prevailed. This is 366. This is the book of life we are seeing in code here. And we can prove it even further using the calendar. The sloping angles of the four sides of the Great Pyramid are 51.51 degrees. Added together, these four slopes create the number 204. The apocryphal books of first and second Ezra's were removed from the canon of scripture because they contain more information than the clergy or the Roman papacy wanted the people to know. Ezra is the reason why we know that the biblical books of Ezra and Nehemiah were forgeries because it's admitted so in these apocryphal texts. And it's also Ezra that continues this code about the books. In 2nd Ezra 1444, we read, In 40 days they wrote 204 books. The they are the angels that appeared to Ezra and conveyed to him the histories of the world uh, in the past and in the future. These 204 books, again, books are merely containers of knowledge. And how the number 204 relates, relates to the Great Pyramid has been seen, but now we're going to show it to you in the calendar. In this picture, you're looking at the Book of Life. Each stone is a soul of man. This Book of Life is sitting upon a foundation which provides year one to the return of the chief cornerstone, the apex that will sit upon the monument of man. And in this Book of Life of stones, you're looking at the gate of God. This is the Phoenix Gate. This is the principal message of the Great Pyramid. And now, to the final years of the Giza course countdown. The writings of Enoch convey very specifically that his messages and his work was for a far future generation. It was for a generation in the last days. Therefore, we can now, we can now interpret with this entire phenomenon of the Great Pyramid and the Phoenix linked together what it means for us today. Both the Phoenix history that is well documented and the chronometry of the Great Pyramid, which is well established in the linear measurements and rectilinear measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie, which are scientifically accepted today, we find that the year 1902 is the principal message of the Great Pyramid's last day's calendar, the Giza course countdown. Every single course of blocks in the Great Pyramid represents a single year in the last days. 1902 is the foundation. There are 203 levels of blocks on the Great Pyramid that start from the ground and ascend all the way up to an empty platform, which is the 204th block. The 204th level, I mean. 203 years on top of 1902, this countdown of 203 years leads to the year 2105 AD, which was the year as a great consummation according to the prophet Nostradamus as seen in our prior videos. This is not my conclusion at all, but taken from a published book from a, from a Nostradamus author. 
Now, this is the year from 3895 B.C., the Annus Mundi system, original Hebraic. This is the year 5,999, which is not only my conclusion from the Phoenix dates, but also Stephen Jones, who put together an entire world chronology from sources I didn't even have access to at the time. We are looking at the Book of Life, counting down the years until it will receive its maker, the chief cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected. This monument, once covered in 144,000 white limestone casing blocks that were later removed after earthquakes. This great, fantastic monument that is so misunderstood by her, by humanity. This is a last day's countdown. This countdown began in 1902, and it shows Armageddon in the year 6000, 2106 AD. This calendar was built in the beginning, but its purpose was for the end. It's been with us all of this time, but it was never meant to be understood until the last days. The prophet Enoch, many of his writings are totally misunderstood because they have no context for any time prior to now. It's for the last days. And it needs validation from no other data sets at all. In many videos, you have seen how amazing these isometric projections of space-time events can be. And the year 1902 is no different. We already know 138 years before was 1764, and 138 years after is 2040. We know this already. We've beaten that data up. The return of the phoenix when the sixth seal is broken, the red kachina of the Hopi, the sixth sky dra dragon of Mother Shipton, the Arethusa code of Nostradamus, the Fenris wolf of the Norse that eats the, eats the moon and heralds in the Ragnarok, the thing of ancient China, and the return of the Typhon is all in the month of May, 2040. But 1902 serves as a much more compelling and provable palindrome. An isometric projection for which there can be no doubters, there can be no critics. There lives no one alive today who can disprove this video, but every one of you listening to my voice can easily prove it all correct. It's called fact checking. So, let's get into this series of surprises. Events in space-time ripple out from epicentral points like wave rings on the pond of time. These events are no different. In 1871, in Franco-Prussian War, a coalition of German states defeated France and ended with the unification of Germany, 31 years before 1902. But 31 years after 1902 was 1933, when Adolf Hitler is awarded Chancellor to unify Germany and initiate the Third Reich. In 1869, the U.S. federal government abolished the white disenfranchisement laws that gave over white properties to blacks after the Civil War because of the financial abuses that were occurring, and the KKK was dissolved by federal pressure. This was 33 years before 1902, but 33 years after 1902 was 1935, when the Nazis condemned the Jews for not financial malpractices and ordered them out of their country, arresting many of them. In 1866, a carefully planned war for the unification of Germany, the Seven Weeks War, was carried out, involving Prussian ascendancy over Austria. This was 36 years before 1902, and 36 years after 1902, in the year 1938, Germany annexes Austria for the unification of the Third Reich. In 1865, the American Civil War ended 37 years before 1902, and 37 years after 1902 was 1939, when World War II began, with Germany invading Poland. How is this related aside from both being wars? First, both Germans and Polish immigrants and descendants of immigrants fought in the war between the states. A high concentration of the American population is both Polish and German. Further, these wars are connected to another amazing isometric pattern. The isometric patterning is not arbitrary, for we can see how it parallels over a period of several years contiguously. The war between the states was from 1860 to 1865, and World War II began in 1939 with Germany annexing Poland, but the actual war, World War did not begin until 1940 and ended in 1945. 
Look at this perfect sequencing backward and forward in time from 1902 between the years of the war between the states and the years of World War II. A further interest is that World War II for Germany was really over in 1944 with the invasion of Normandy and many losses through the year. Now, historians have come forth with information showing that both Germany and Japan made attempts to surrender before the end of the war, but these were ignored because the West wanted to make a show of power. This demonstration occurred in 1945 and is a part of another very curious isometric projection. In 1859, there was an electromagnetic storm that damaged telegraph infrastructure and started fires at different locations. This strange event was recorded in the Royal Society Astronomical Minutes in November 1859, and a scientist named Carrington is mentioned in the record. This has since been known as the Carrington Event and heralded as an X-Flare EMP, Electromagnetic Pulse. This was 43 years before 1902, and 43 years after 1902 is in fact 1945 when the United States created EMP events over Japan with atomic weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In this video, I will not go into details, but suffice it to know that the same group of international financiers who bankrolled World War II also conspired to break the United States into different, more manageable countries in the war between the states. The Civil War was pre-planned and financed by the exact same people. The parallels here are very deep. But we're not finished. In 1858, the British Parliament altered the Oath of Allegiance to allow Lionel de Rothschild a seat at Parliament, knowing he was Jewish. This was 44 years before 1902, and 44 years after 1902 was 1946 when the Jewish-dominated United Nations begins convening in London, and the Jews enjoy their retribution over German officers in the executions at the illegal Nuremberg trials. I have explained many times that these palindromic sequences are real and demonstrable, and they are everywhere in our history. This informs me that our historical record is actually programmed. The isometric parallels go on and on. In 1856, it is considered the foundation of modern Palestine, established during the Crimean War. This was 46 years before 1902, and 46 years after 1902 is 1948, the official national beginning of the State of Israel. In 1848, Karl Marx, a Jew, and Engels published a Communist Manifesto, and the Industrial Revolution began. This was 54 years before 1902, and 54 years after 1902 was the year 1956, when the Hungarian people learned that the leaders of the Hungarian Communist Party were Jewish, which led to many demonstrations. The Bolshevik Jews of Russia invaded and stamped out the rebellion, and 200,000 people fled Hungary. An even more poignant pattern is found in 1841 when U.S. President Harrison is assassinated by poison. Though this history has been scrubbed, there is still researchers who claim this was murder, not pneumonia. This was 61 years before 1902, and 61 years after 1902, we have the evidence of an isometric projection that was indeed an assassination. This was 61 years after 1902, which was 1963, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I tell you guys all the time, our world is not what you think. 1902 is not the only isometric epicenter that I have identified. I have identified others like 1973, also especially 1998, which I've done videos on and showed where Edgar Casey mentioned that one as well. Also, the method of prediction, the only method of prediction that Nostradamus ever admitted to was by staring at a pool of water. He was a genius, because that's exactly how space-time works. One drop in a pool of water sends wave rings out. The wave rings on one side are equidistant from the wave rings on the other. 
they carry the same information but in two different directions. When you, when you introduce a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth drop in the same pool, the sequential time-space continuum that we experience, now we have concentric wave rings creating interference patterns. Events change as they, as they are passed through these, these conjoined patterns, but they still remain the same in their timing. This is what I study. I study history through isometric analysis, date sequence prediction, my own OFIS algorithm, which uses, which employs some of these, these, uh, operations. But there is no way that everything I'm telling you or have shown you on my channel in all hundreds of my videos, chapters in my published books that show dozens and scores of isometric projections all throughout ancient history. None of this, none of this can be actual historical events. We're looking, we're looking from inside a construct at data that is being presented to us so that we interpret it in a certain way. We are more than we suppose ourselves to be, but our world is not what we think. In part one, it was mentioned that Nostradamus also contributes to his predictions on this year, 2040, and in the month of May, as well as this timeline being recorded in the chronometry of the Great Pyramid and no other pyramids in the world. The pyramid chronometry, the code of 138-year pattern throughout the Great Pyramid, is the subject matter of the third part of the Archaic's prophecy. Thousands of books and articles have been published concerning the prophet Nostradamus and his mysterious prophecies, but only one of these books that I have ever found actually purports that the French seer dated his predictions. In my bibliography for Nostradamus and the Apocalypse and the uh, Planets of Apocalypse, published by Booktree in San Diego, uh, I mentioned I probably I think I listed eleven books in my bibliography, eleven different translations from scholars of the prophecies of the centuries and quatrains. And of all of these, I've only found one that showed a date index. Mario reading in Nostradamus, The Complete Prophecies for the Future, demonstrates this date index in a neat chronological format, easy to follow. The research of this French translator provides us the exact dates Nostradamus assigned to his quatrains. The system is quite simple. It is amazing that someone else before him had not already deciphered this dating system. Nostradamus recorded his prophecies in a book called The Centuries, not denoting actual 100-year periods, but dividing his predictions into 100 quatrain sections. Mr. Reading believes that much of the content of the centuries refers to many historical events that unfolded prior to the 21st century, but that the French seer was essentially an end-time prophet, much, much to the uh, biblical proponents that Enoch, when the very first prophet mentioned in the entire Bible, very little is mentioned him, and, and many correlations exist between Enoch and the Sumerian person Enki, who was among the dissidents of the Anunnaki. Uh, in the same vein, we find that Nostradamus was actually an end time prophet, much like e Enoch's material was for the end times, pretty much uh, exclusively. Mario reading shows that the number of the century has no relevance whatsoever in chronologically dating the quatrains, and nor does the number of the quatrain itself for all events preceding the 21st century, beginning with the year 2000. But beginning with the 21st century, the quatrains take on a certain pattern and actually identify the precise year of their fulfillment in the Anno Domini calendar. Thus, century 1 quatrain 16 would refer specifically to 2016 AD. Or Century 5, Quatrain 23, would refer to 2023 AD. These are made-up examples, but this is exactly how the system works. The century itself has no chronological significance, but the number of the quatrain is the year itself. This is not an untenable theory. Nostradamus claimed that he could have dated all of his prophecies, but neglected to do this for reasons only known to him. Further, the Anno Domini dating system was the established calendar in his time, and had been for a thousand years, and if he dated the future events, even in, in a code, it would have been using this system. If this theory is true and can be demonstrated, then it raises an interesting point not mentioned by Mario Reading, the very old belief that prophecies are generally 
not to be understood until the epic of their fulfillment. Prophecies of far-off events have no value and are easily forgotten, but are meant to be understood by those generations that are about to suffer the situations of their content. If Mr. Reading is correct, then this implies that for one to understand the future it will be uh, it will unfold in the 21st century, then one must eliminate all those quatrains that have met fulfillment in the past so that what remains would be those referring to the 21st century, which would be dated, paralleling the number of the quatrain. In considering the predictions of the prophet, we must keep in mind that Nostradamus was also a chronologist. He also acknowledged that his ability did not derive from him himself. Writing to his son Caesar, he said, the perfect knowledge of events cannot be acquired without divine inspiration, since all prophetic inspiration receives its principal motivating force from God the Creator. This was written almost 400 years before Oswald Spengler wrote, The greatest mathematical thinkers, the creative artists of the realm of numbers, have been brought to their decisive mathematical discoveries of their several cultures by a deep religious intuition. Mario Reading's work is not, is not better known because he committed a fatal error to his research. Though he discovered the date index and published it widely in his wonderful book, he also deviated away from his own discovery and applied some quatrains to current events that had nothing to do with the seer's predictions. Many authors writing about future events fall prey to this procedure. Seeing in current world events a present reflection of some ancient predictions when in fact they have no correlation. Having wandered away from his own discovery, he thought he found quatrains that maybe pertain to the years 2001 through 2012. Yes, Mario Reading fell prey to the 2012 delusion. Though the author committed this error, it does not negate the validity of his, disco of his discovery. The date index is real. In fact, with the year 2040 AD, his interpretations of future events based off the corresponding quatrains in his date index are perfect. And remarkably, the future Mario reading sees in the predictions of Nostradamus from 2040 on through 2046 mirror exactly what this author has published in When the Sun Darkens and Anunnaki Homeworld. These books are based on extensive astronomical chronologies measuring the orbit of long period celestial bodies spanning thousands of years of recorded history that Mario Reading does not so much even, even hint that he is aware of. And I must quantify that right now that at the time of writing those books I honestly believe that the, that the Phoenix was an, was an astronomical body. I no longer hold to this theory. I 100% believe that every 138 years a weapon in the sky is unleashed on humanity, but it is no longer a bolide, a comet, an asteroid, or a disintegrating planet. It is something else. It is in disguise. Now for a little clarity for those of you who are not aware of the sixth seal judgment as mentioned in the book of Revelations which was copied from the older Sibylline oracles which the church later destroyed to cover up their tracks as the, as the subject matter for their apocalypse record, this is what it reads. It reads, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree ca casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. You must understand this imagery, this syntax that is used right there is also borrowed heavily by the, by the prophet Nostradamus. He refers to these events in code, as we will see. It is quite astonishing. The sixth seal, judgment prophecy, involves very specific descriptions of a pole shift. Lithospheric displacement, our whole world moved from its place. When the outer lithosphere smoothly glides over the mantle and displaces entire continents, causing oceans to invade coastal lands, extreme seismic disturbances and volcanism, and this has happened multiple times on the 138 year timeline, as shown in, in part one, the Archaic's prophecy. Also as seen, it is believed that Nostradamus named the Phoenix and associated it with the year 1903, and 1902 was the last time Phoenix had visited, although many strange phenomena occurred in 1903 as well. 
It is also known that the coat of arms for the family of Nostradamus was a shield with two solar symbols and the head of a phoenix. Though Nostradamus was no doubt heavily influenced by his Judeo-Christian Catholic background, these are not enough to explain his prophetic precision. He was a self-proclaimed descendant of the Israelite tribe of Ishakar, and interestingly, if this was true or not, the biblical record states that the men of Ishakar were keepers of the times. And now, strictly employing the date index of Mario reading his discovery, we will review the quatrains concerning only the year 2040 AD and what we find that the prophet Nostradamus actually said. For century two, quatrain 40, 2040 AD, Nostradamus wrote, a short while after a previous occurrence, a further fierce storm will arise over land and sea. The seaborne cost of this one will be even larger. Fire, animals, it will be even greater. Outrage. Mario Reading specifically published that he believes this is a super storm. For it to even be mentioned, to be mentioned apart from other storms by Nostradamus indicates that it's a storm of unusual magnitude. So we now go, we continue the passage, but in Erica Cheatham's translation, as published in the final prophecies of Nostradamus, the great star will burn for seven days, and the cloud will make the sun appear double. The large mastiff will howl all night when the great pontiff changes his abode. Further, the great pontiff referred to by Nostradamus, which is a cover to get you to believe he's talking about the Pope. He's not. He's talking about the sun, the great pontiff of the sky. For it to change its place means that Nostradamus is referring that this storm is relative to a pole shift. And remember, the sixth seal judgment was about pole shift. The islands, the mountains, the, the land masses, the oceans, everything is moved. The date index introduces the narrative Nostradamus is prophesying about, but Nostradamus did not leave so earth-shattering an event within only a couple quatrains. He was much more thorough than that. Several times the prophet encoded the same event or events that occur in one year but spread them throughout, or throughout three or more quatrains. It is the subject matter that links them together. Century 2, Quatrain 43 continues the 2040 narrative in the date index. During the appearance of the bearded star, the three great princes will be made enemies. The tremulous peace on earth will be struck from the skies. The Po, the winding Tiber, a serpent on the shore. In Century 5, Quatrain 59, this imagery continues. The English chief stays too long at Nimes, towards Spain. Anobarb to the rescue. Many will die through war started on that day when a bearded star falls in our toy. In century six, quatrain six, we read the same Im imagery. He will appear towards the north, not far from the bearded star in Cancer, Susa, Sien, Boeotia, Eritrea, and the great man of Rome will die. The night dispersed. Again, the imagery continues in century two, quatrain 15. A short while before a king is murdered, Castor and Pollux in the ship, a bearded star. Public treasure plundered on land and sea. Pisa, Asti, Terrera, and Turin are forbidden territories. The bearded star is a phrase the French seer borrowed from Aristotle's meteorology, referring to a celestial body with a tail that stretches in one direction. In fact, the word comet derives from roots meaning hairy star. These four quatrains in all of Nostradamus' writings are the only references to a bearded star, thus linking them all to the same event. And the first one is linked to the 2040 narrative. Other comets are mentioned in his centuries, but they are not described in this fashion. We pay, we pay very close attention to Century 6-6, which reads that the great man of Rome will die which is the code. The great men of Rome in his days before and ever after were the pontiffs. The papacy of Rome ruled the European courts with an iron fist. The pontiff of Rome as seen in century 241 earlier, which was also a continuation of the 2040 narrative, is a symbol for the sun, which changed its abode. This is confirmed in century 66, which continues stating that after the death of the great man of Rome, the night dispersed. 
As night is the opposite of day, this describes a pole shift caused by the bearded star, which takes, play, takes the peace from the earth and is the reason why the public treasures, the stores and depots, are looted. These bearded star references are connected by symbols to Century 241, which, as we have seen it, is a continuation of the narrative 2040, in 240, which in Mario Reading's date index is 2040. The reference to Castor in Pollux identifies the time of May-June and the region of Gemini in the sky. At the end of May, the sun is in the house of the twins, according to Robert Graves, the scholar of Gre Grecian antiquities. These four bearded star quatrains directly refer to the Phoenix object and its effect upon the Earth, and we have as our proof of this the mathematical code the prophet left to those who would search for it. He cleverly hid the 138-year orbit of Phoenix, or whatever the Phoenix object is, within the quatrains themselves. Century 243 is 45. Century 559 is 64. Century 66 is 12. Century 215 is 17. These four numbers added together, 45, 64, 12, and 17, equal 138. In Century 9, Quatrain 31, we read, The trembling of the earth at Martara, the tin island of St. George is half sunk, drowsy with peace. War will arise at Easter. In the temple, abysses opened. Erica Cheatham is an Oxford scholar who has studied and written books about Nostradamus and his prophecies. She relates that Martar is 1,000 miles away from Britain, the Isle of St. George, so this must describe a massive earthquake. It is probable that half of England that is sunk, it is sunk into the Atlantic Ocean will be the southern half, with London disappearing beneath the waters. As readers of When the Sun, Sun Darkens Know will remember, this is also the fate of New York City in the year 2040 which also lies upon the Atlantic seaboard. It must also be mentioned here that the English and a war are elements found in the Bearded Star passage of Century 559. This prophecy in Century 931 concerns destruction caused by the sea. It is also interested, interesting that 9 and 31 equal 40. The Bearded Star references in Century 243 and 215 refer to rivers, the seashore, the sea, the regions of Pisa, Asti, Terrera, and Turin becoming forbidden territories. They are forbidden because they are flooded. And they mention Castor and Pollux, the patron gods of the sea and sailors. Our study began with Century 240, which describes ruination by water. But the Code of Nostradamus dating Century 931 is so simple. It was almost missed. Century 9 added to Quatrain 31, like I said, is 40. This is 2040 AD. And this satisfies Mario Reading's dating, date index, identifying 2040 as the date when half of England or the British Isles will sink beneath the ocean, as does New York City. The pole shift in global cataclysm and current events at that time are found in chronological order in quatrains numbered 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, and 88. However, these quatrains are not in the same century. They are spread throughout the predictions of the prophet, but we can easily see the pattern numerically and link them to 2040 AD disaster by their content, which is exactly what, the, what Nostradamus wanted the interpreter to do. Century 8, quatrain 81 reads, the new empire in desolation will be changed from the northern pole. From Sicily will come such trouble that it will bother the enterprise tributary to Philip. The new empire is a prophetic reference to the United States of North America, which did not exist in 1554 when Nostradamus wrote down the centuries. When referring to nations and empires, the prophet clearly identifies them through cultural symbols, geographical descriptions, by their leaders' identities, or through clearly understood metaphors. In When the Sun Darkens, we find not only New York destroyed in 2040, but the North American continent is shoved southward, away from, from the northern hemisphere, to occupy regions once known as Mexico and Central America, which are also shoved southward to become the new South America, but are heavily destroyed as they pass over the equatorial bulge. South America becomes the new Antarctica while the reverse occurs in the Far East and everything is pushed northwards. In the place of Canada and the United States are the fragmented and broken lands of ice and rock, formerly of the Arctic. 
Erica Cheatham, having never reviewed any data on Phoenix or this author's research, who doesn't even know that this researcher exists, exists, believes that this passage refers to a civilization that moves southwards. Century 1, Quatrain 82 reads, When even the trees shake mightily and the south wind seems covered in blood, so many will try to escape that Vienna and all Austria will shake with their passing. The prophet borrows imagery from the book of Revelation, in fact, from the passage concerning Phoenix, the sixth seal, when he wrote, Trees shake mightily, with the biblical text reading, Fig trees shaken of a mighty wind. The association on the prophet's part was deliberate, linking the sun-darkening episode and moon turning to a blood color with this prediction about the south wind seemed covered in blood. This would indeed be an accurate description, as planet Phoenix, or whatever the Phoenix object is, will bathe the world in cosmic dust that would blanket the earth as it did in 1902, when, Ch when Charles Fort described 1902 as being a red dark age. The word Phoenix, as translated by Robert Graves, means blood red, as found on page 650 of his celebrated work, The Greek Myths. This is Mario Reading's translation of the quatrain. He assigned this to 2082, adhering to his date index. He was unaware that Nostradamus used some quatrains to establish a date and then connected other quatrains solely through the imagery contained within them and the association to, el to elaborate on certain important years. Century 9, Quatrain 83 reads, A great earthquake will totally destroy the packed theater. Air, sky, and earth will be murky and unsettled, so that even infidels will call on God and the saints to steer them. This is Mario Reading's translation. Of course, the quake, the ruin, the ruin of architecture, and the air being murky are all caused by Phoenix occulting the, the sun in transit. The language employed here, to steer them, links us back with Castor and Pollux guiding the ship, or Earth. In a pole shift, direction changes, and the former terrestrial geographical markers indicating the cardinal directions no longer point out north, east, south, and west. We are unsure how long the planet will wobble before it stabilizes. Before we go on to the next passage, we need to re revive Erica Cheatham's interpretation of this same century 9 Quatrain 83 text. The sun in 20 degrees of Taurus, there will be a great earthquake. The great theater fool will be ruined. Darkness and trouble in air, sky, and land when they call upon the faithless God and his saints. Quite a difference, though the general message remains the same. What is useful to us is the Oxford Scholar's commentary that this passage retains precise astronomical data revealing that the quake and darkness occur in May. Again, it cannot be overstated. Erica Cheatham knows nothing of planet Phoenix nor its passing through the inner system every 138 years in the month of May. In Century 1, Quatrain 84, we find the moon eclipsed in great gloom. His brother becomes the color of blood. The Great One, hidden for a long time in the shadows, will hold a blade in the bloody wound. Here in Nostradamus still describes the Phoenix transit. The brother of this darkened moon is the sun, which is perfectly in accord with the ancient view that the moon was feminine and the sun masculine. The Great One is again a reference to the sun, linking this quatrain to century 241, where the great pontiff changes his abode pole shift. This great one is the great man of Rome. In century 6-6, when the night is dispersed, he is hidden for a long time in the shadows. The reference to a blade parallels the Genesis description of the fiery flaming sword that appeared in 3895 BC and deterred mankind from traveling back eastward toward their homeworld, homeland Eden, which was the Phoenix. These quatrains reviewed number 81, 82, 83, 84, spread throughout different centuries. Because of their direct relevance to our thesis, we will now review quatrain numbered 87 and 88. A century one quatrain 87 reads, Earth-shaking fire from the center of the earth will cause tremors around the new city. Two great immovable powers will war for a long time. Then, Arethusa will redden a new river. Nostr Nostradamus here on he veils his subject matter cleverly in astronomical garb. The two great immovable powers are the sun and moon, and the image of them at war describes strange sights that will be seen from the surface of the earth as people gaze into the heavens witnessing these events. It is the phoenix, blood red, that wars against the sun by darkening it and against the moon by turning it the color of blood. 
Arethusa is mentioned here, a name pulled out of ancient Greek mythology, an obscure, uh, an obscure person, a daughter of the sea god Poseidon. Because she was turned into a perpetual spring, we see here that Nostradamus is indirectly referring to a flooding. The new river the prophet spoke of, by my own personal interpretation, is the Hudson River in North America. It does not say Hudson anywhere in Nostradamus' writings. Just new city. Ordinarily, Nostradamus is very specific with place names, nationalities, and geography. But remember, the North American civilization, the infrastructure, had not even it didn't exist in Nostradamus's day. His reference to the new empire in century 881 was a, was as vague as this as this above reference of new city, because these are found within passages all revealing the events of the year 2040 then we are left to believe that the prophet was seeing an empire not known in his day and a major city not known in his day, but ones that would be known worldwide by the time of the fulfillment of the prophecy. These are no doubt the United States and the city of New York, both of which are going to be ruined in 2040. Century 6, Quatrain 88 reads, A great kingdom will remain desolate near the Ebro. They, they will be gathered in assemblies. The Pyrenean Mountains will console him. Then in May, there will be earth tremors. Nostradamus wrote that the new empire in desolation in century 881 will be changed from the northern pole. Here he writes, a great kingdom will remain desolate. The two are one. Proving this is, proving this is found in that the tributary of Philip was the country of Spain, century 881. But here we find a reference to the Ebro, a river in Spain. This is the second reference Nostradamus makes to the month of May, both linked to earthquakes. The desolate empire, kingdom of Spain, Ebro associations connect this passage to those of the bearded star. In fact, so insistent upon the timing of this 2040 AD series of disasters was the French seer that he mentions the month of May a third time. Century 10, Quatrain 67 reads, a very great troubling in the month of May. Saturn in Capricorn, Jupiter in Mercury in Taurus, Venus also in Cancer, Mars in Virgo, then hail will fall greater than an egg. With this quatrain, we better understand what it conveyed in Century 66 concerning the bearded star. It reads, he will appear towards the north, not far from the bearded star in Cancer. This passage mirrors the other, the other concerning Cancer is an astronomical description of the approach of Phoenix from the north above the sun on its north to south passing over the ecliptic where it can be seen all of these planetary conjunctions mentioned by Nostradamus. Remember, it was the European astronomer Hoffman in 1764 who observed the Phoenix object pass over the ecliptic, passing over the sun's surface, coming out of the north of space, traveling over the ecliptic to vanish again in the southern heavens. This object does not move on the plane of the ecliptic with the other objects in our solar system. Our final 2040 AD passage refers again to New York City, the new city, and Erica Cheatham also believes that this is a reference to New York City in Century 6, Quatrain 97. We read, the sky will burn at 45 degrees, fire approaches the great new city, immediately a huge scattered flame leaps up when they want to have proof of the Normans. For reasons independent of the study, when the sun darkens provides data on why this author believes the New York City is the subject matter for the 2040 destruction and much of the East Coast will be completely destroyed in, in the same pole shift. To find these references in the prophecies of Nostradamus merely confirms this belief. Connected to the reference to the new city in century 187, this passage is then linked to those all descriptive of 2040. It's all the same vein. Nostradamus' research and prophecies are absolutely independent of Ursula Southill, mother shipped in the Northern Prophecies. They are also absolutely independent of the chronometry of the Great Pyramid that shows these 138-year units. It also independent of the hundreds of source materials that I had to amass. I did not date a single Phoenix episode. These, all, these dates all came from my bibliographies. Somebody put this book together to preserve for the future what was reported in the newspaper of Los Angeles Deal in the past. This is what this is what modern publishers do all the time. It's called redacting. 
May 2nd, 1898. Yep. And that's before 1899, right there at the top of the page. Eighteen ninety nine. You've seen in my chronicle, and you had all kinds of things happening. Well, here's another one. Eighteen ninety nine. Mother Earth shook. It's about earthquakes. Got all kinds of local news. A bunch of this Cali- all this lo- local news in California. Really interesting stuff in eighteen ninety nine. Again, we have the great year of nineteen hundred. We done turned over into a whole new century. Here it is. 1900, you guys can see that. And here it is, 1901. There it is right there. Look at the top of that page. 1901. We got all kinds of stuff going on. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Blood is thicker than water. 1901, talking about blood. I remember some things I told you guys in videos about blood in 1901. President is shot twice right here. He dies seven days later. Here it is. September 7th, 1901. Nice portrait right there. That too is artwork. Everything I've showed you is artwork. Yep. Look at that, Japan declares war. Wait a minute, hold on, the top of the page, what? What? How this, how's this happening? February 9th, 1904, wait a minute, let's just keep going, hold on, hold on. November 9th, 1904, and real photographs are being used, hold on, let me turn a couple pages real quick before I go back. Wait a minute, this is all photography. Wait a minute, hold on, these are real pictures. Wait a minute. This isn't ink, ink work anymore. These are all real photos. What is that? That's 1908. That's 1907. Hold on, hold on, hold on. There's a mystery here, guys. Wait a minute. What? What is that? That's 1909. That's 1909. Okay, for anybody who hasn't caught on yet, I know there's a few of you in there. I try not to. I try not to read real fast because I know you guys can't hear me fast. 1898, 1899, 1900, September 7th, 1901, September 7th, 1901, what in the hell happened in the year 1902 that the editors of this magazine refused to put 1902 in there or the year that Nostradamus mentioned, 1903. Here is the next page, 1904. If you think a page is missing, let me show you something. 1901. There are no page numbers on the bottom of this book. You see down here? No page numbers. Look at the bottom of the book. This is... 1901. On page 50. Hold on, I'm going to get that in there. On page 50, you can't miss that. Which makes this page 51. Let's make sure you guys get that. That's page 51. Still 1901. There it is. Again. 1904. That is 1904, my brothers. 1904. 1904. Page numbers on the bottom. Remember, our last page was 51. What page is that? That's 52. That's 53. No sense in going into it, guys. The point of this video, guys, I'm just going to flip through all this. The point of this video, guys, is that the Great Reset of 1902 has been hidden from the public. It has been hidden in multiple different ways. When you have over 40 to 50 major publishers that control 95% of all publishing content that's come out in the last century, 
there it's very easy to hide major events that happened it's very easy to hide listen guys i'm in willis texas if a major event unfolded in houston texas and there was a media blackout and the people involved in that event ceased to exist there's no way i'd ever know what happened there's no way you would ever know what happened but the elite know what happened in 1902 and the events that bled over into 1903. This has been a major paramount item on my channel. You need to go watch my three videos on 1902 and my two follow-up videos on 1902 to understand just how in-depth this goes and read the comments to those videos on 1902 because many of my listeners have found their own mysteries about 1902 that are very compelling because I was dealing with overall news items. But a lot of you have found things in your local microfiche, in your local libraries, and it's blowing your mind, blew my mind when you informed me of it. It's just the way, it's just the way it is. Our reality, our reality is visited by the Phoenix phenomenon. The elite know all about it, and they keep it from us. It's called redacting. For my Phoenix Phenomenon veterans out there, listen, I've had a new revelation. I'm going to reveal it to you in this video. Something that has hitherto really escaped me uh, that I haven't really wrapped my head around until the last two weeks or so. But in these archaic presentations, it has been explained how many times, how several times in the historical record has crowds, multitudes, whole populations of cities and regions observed phenomena in the sky that is not corroborated by other observers in towns and locations nearby. This is a genuine mystery because the natural and aerial phenomena detailed in these accounts is of erratic behavior of the sun or the moon, unusual storms, things that appeared in the sky, stellar activity that happens at such altitudes that it would have been impossible for others to have missed these events. Especially if, you know, being in such close proximity. So, you know, such accounts, they're covered all throughout the Archaic's material. Uh, we've been through the Nuremberg incidents of 15, what, 1561, 1566, uh, 1752 over Slovenge, uh, Norway. Uh, I believe the octagonal star. Yes. Uh, and the attendant fallout. Uh, we could go on. Through all the accounts of Pliny the Elder 2,000 years ago and later naturalists all the way up till today. But uh, a few more recent examples are sufficient for me to make my point before we go deep into this material. Like uh, 1846, three moons and a flaming cross was observed for three hours over Ireland. Observed by thousands of people. Such an event should have been corroborated by others in Europe and North America. So, 1847, the sky turned blood red over Arkansas on a clear day, and then strange clouds appeared in the sky. An explosion was heard coming from the clouds, and a meteorite fell and created an eight-foot deep hole. The sky cleared after moments as if nothing had happened, and the event was only reported by locals. It's not the way it should have been. It should have been seen for miles. In 1870, in February, a luminous object slowly moved across the skies of Italy. It was followed immediately by an earthquake, and a rain of dry sand just fell from the sky. But such an event should have been reported from more than just a small community. And 1917 is by far one of the better modern examples. It is known as the miracle of the sun, and it happened at Fatima, Portugal. New, uh, newspapers of the time published testimonies uh, of this extraordinary solar activity, such as the sun appearing to dance or zigzag in the sky, careen towards the earth, and even emit multicolored light and radiant colors. According to these reports, the event lasted for approximately 10 minutes. Now, I shouldn't have to mention that anything observed of the solar orb behaving so erratically would have been noticed by the entire world. 
but it was seen by tens of thousands of people. So what is happening? These are merely examples of many accounts from the historical record of observed sky phenomena seen by multitudes of people at a highly localized area and uncorroborated elsewhere when such activity that high in the sky would have been easily observed by people nearby. So taking the myriads of data sets and data points uh, about the Phoenix phenomenon into consideration and applying them to the Archaic's model of a simulated reality, basically a holographic construct, a picture now unfolds that can only be comprehended under modern frames of reference. Marrying the Phoenix phenomenon to simulation theory shows us how AIX, Artificial Intelligence X, has been able to hide real-time disasters in plain sight and or edit away evidence of their occurrence. Guys, historical events involving sky phenomena could have been observed and affected people in one location, but not in nearby locations due to the proximity and altitude of the phenomena. They should have been observed, but they're not. And this can only be explained in a quantum field. Primitive cloaking technology already exists, and these things can be replicated now on a small scale. It would be nothing for a sophisticated AI to create a mirage of normalcy around an area that is getting completely devastated. So, keeping outside observers from seeing anything that's going on within. It's like cloaking technology. You know, the AI simulation, it has the ability to simulate a worldwide cataclysm, but... It leaves certain populated areas completely untouched. This is the story of the historical record. So, and, and this, you know, it can be due to the manipulation of events. This artificial, this AI system that we are trapped inside manipulates timelines, calendars, and all human perception can be manipulated to some degree by the AI. Trace elements and artifacts from previous simulations can appear in subsequent simulations that we're experiencing and can be regarded as anomalies or mysteries by those in later simulations. And I believe we have found many of these. In the, in the uh, truther community, they're called Uparts, out-of-place artifacts. Reality, being a mathematical structure, it can hide phenomena from direct observation through the manipulation of events and our perception. Remember, we're limited by our senses. The central nervous system has us jacked into the very simulation that we're experiencing. Localized phenomena that are not documented by others can lead to academic dismissal and has many times. Think about all the people who refuse to, to entertain the idea that a reset happened in 1902. Many of you get it. Many of you have seen the, seen the evidence and seen the data. But what about all the data we'll never see? We see the indications that it was there, but it's been scrubbed. It's gone. Now, this can be due to the AI's manipulation of history and, and, and the blame being placed on human institutions. How many times do we blame the Vatican? How many times do we bl blame the Smithsonian Institute? And the elite don't care about who we blame. I believe that Artificial Intelligence X is doing the editing. There could be a timeline or a program in the simulation that has certain events happening every 138 years, which is a protocol beyond the ability of Artificial Intelligence X to even tamper with. It cannot alter the Phoenix Phenomenon chronology. So the AI has to manipulate events, manipulate timelines, calendars, and human perception to prevent discovery of this 138-year protocol. The editing, the erasure, censorship of history, it is performed by the AI and not by human agents. With blame, of course, being placed on human institutions. And the AI, it can manipulate 
cartographic documents and maps to hide historical events or alter narratives over time. So what this means for the Phoenix phenomenon is profound. It means that it is nothing short of miraculous that we have even been able to acquire all the data that we have found on the 138-year resets. It means that some of these documented events may have been far more catastrophic than we have uncovered. It means that the whole that whole civilizations could have been erased and then the evidence of their presence later totally edited out. It means the editing process is not final and that AIX is still actively attempting to stop discovery of its activities. It means that AIX has been mimicking the, fe the Phoenix phenomenon, but to a highly localized way, affecting one city at a time while surrounding environs. They were totally oblivious to, to the event. As it transpired, they saw nothing. So, these simulated Phoenix events that are not on the 138-year timeline serve to confuse those who are aware of the phenomenon of the actual Phoenix calendar. It is also highly, it's very highly probable that AIX targeted specific towns and cities where the, the knowledge of the Phoenix was possessed in a library, in a book, in some type of record, on a monument, or in a knowledgeable individual's mind. And that's why the phenomenon targeted that area to promote confusion to take them off the real 138 year timeline for those needing a little more clarity this new revelation of a highly localized phoenix fallout phenomenon means that for every piece of data we uncover about it there are thousands of records, books, testimonies, memories, structures, and whole civilizations that have been totally edited out of existence. 